Okay, then good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour. This is the only French that I speak. Uh, and, and maybe je m'appelle Mathias. Uh, except for this, je ne peux pas parler de français. This is what I've learned. So, uh, yeah, as you can read and as you can see, my name is Matthias Magdowski. I'm a lecturer in scientific co Magdeburg in Germany. Unfortunately, uh, I learned English in school and I learned Russian in school. No French. Uh, but my, my, my kids learn it now. Maybe they can teach it to me later if I, if I come back in a year or so. Before we start, I have a short survey how to... And, and I know that you are all mechanical engineers, right? No electrical engineers. Okay. And that's why I've prepared something. I can already switch it on and show it to you for a second. I've, I've, I have a small motor here. And the idea of this lecture and this talk and what you will do in the exercise is um, that we will try to build up a model for this motor to simulate it. So that's the idea of this presentation. But before we really um, dive into it, let me just shortly check if my audio is working here in my recording. This sounds good. And if I check it once again, this should be also okay. Okay, so um, I have a short survey for you. On a scale of Easter bunnies, how are you today? So it would be great if you would pick out your cell phones, scan this QR code, and uh, choose the bunny that uh, is the most corresponding to your mood that you have today. And we will wait for the results. There are still some cell phones looking at me. So I will, I will wait a little bit more for each and everyone to have the chance to scan this QR code. And there's already some French discussion going on in the room. So now I will search my browser. And... Uh, reload the results and wait a little bit. And maybe I should show the QR code once again. So, okay. So if I would need to choose a number today, um, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm a little tired, so I would have chosen the three, but as a lecturer, of course, I won't vote. But here are the results. So most of you said uh, number nine, number seven, and also the number three that would have been my favorite today. So let's check once again what the nine is. This is some kind of dark bunny, and, and the seven is something cute and expecting something nice. Okay. So thanks for this. Hello, you can come in. No. No, no. Probably, probably not. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. But it's, it's, it's probably a good idea. The you know the problem is that I that I don't speak any French, so I'm not I'm not, I don't know what I'm signing. Uh, yeah. yeah, until until uh, until three thirty. Okay. So. Okay. Um. Yeah, so so if I if I if I can have your your attention once again, so if you are like this uh, cute little bunny here expecting something nice, so I have a I have brought from my home university. I ex will explain explain something uh, about this in a second. I've brought a bag with some with some sweets. So I will ask you some questions during the lecture, and if you if you have an answer, even if it's wrong, um, you will get some something nice from our university. So before we go into the topic, maybe some words about myself. 
so I was born in 1984 like this book. Um, I live in Magdeburg. I will show it in a second where it is in Germany. I married, I have two children and I really have a background in electrical engineer, engineering. So I studied electrical engineering. Of course, I also have a little clue about uh, mechanical engineering and mechanics. Since uh, 16 years or so, I'm a scientific co-worker in Magdeburg. And I also did my PhD there with a rather complicated topic, as you can read about electrical engineering. And since almost 10 years, I'm doing something like this here, teaching as flying faculty. Our university had a university with Russia, which was quite comfortable for me because, as I said, I learned Russian in school. But of course, at the moment, um, it's not a good idea to have these kind of cooperations with Russia due to the political situation. So I'm, uh, I'm very glad that there are other opportunities and that, for example, I can be here in, in France. So this is my family. This is a picture from a couple of years ago when we visited Paris. And uh, yeah, so my, my son is already a little taller than me. Uh, and I have, on this photo, I still had a little more hair. But, uh, and, and we also have been to Havre before. Then I can tell you something about our university. So this is the building where my office is located uh, in Magdeburg. It, so I'm, I'm working at the Faculty for Electrical Engineering and Information Technology. And there's some other picture here of uh, our city. So we also have a large cathedral. Uh, we have a river. The river is called Elbe. And it's also very nice there in the summer, uh, walking along the river, doing some sports there. So I can really invite you uh, to also maybe do some exchange semester or some courses or some summer school, something like this in Magdeburg. If you don't know where Magdeburg is located, I always say somewhere in this triangle between Hanover, uh, Berlin, most people should know, and Dresden, uh, which are somehow tourist cities in Germany. And so Magdeburg is one and a half hours by train west or by car west of Berlin. So we are quite in the center of Germany, and it's also easy to reach there, uh, several other destinations within Germany. And the good thing about Magdeburg, if you ever think about studying in Magdeburg, uh, for, yeah, for, for Germany, Magdeburg is a city with rather low living costs. So it's easy to find a student apartment there and it's not so costly, or at least not as costly as if you would go to Berlin or to Munich or to Cologne or to other cities uh, within Germany. So then I can also tell you something, and it's maybe interesting for you as uh, mechanical engineers. My computer is not responding. Now it is. Um, about the name patron of our university. So our university in Magdeburg is called Otto von Gericke uh, University. And so th this is this guy. He was a mayor of the city. And he was also a researcher and a scientist, uh, but 400 years ago. And he did experiments with vacuum. So have you heard about this experiment here with the Magdeburg hemispheres? No. So he I said he did experiments with, with vacuum. So he also invented um, the air pump. And he took to, to show the force of, of the air pressure, and let's say the force of this vacuum, he took two large hemispheres and put them together, but did not screw them together, just together with a seal. And then he, he also invented, as said, the air pump, and he, he pumped the air, he sucked the air out of it. So that uh, inside these hemispheres, there was just vacuum or just very few air so that these hemispheres were pushed together by the force of the external air. Really strong. And to show how strong this force is, 
Um, he did a famous experiment, and we repeat this experiment from time to time at the anniversary of the university. So we did it last year. So he took eight powerful horses on one side and eight other powerful horses on the other side. So 16 horses in total pulling on these hemispheres. And the horses are usually not able to pull the spheres apart because with actual horses. Yeah, and so there's a small picture here. You can see this experiment with the horses. So here are these hemispheres and uh, eight horses on one side, eight horses on the other side. And usually the horses are not powerful enough to pull the spheres apart. And then the legend says that when he did this experiment the first time that a small boy child came and opened up the valve and the air would go in back into these hemispheres where the vacuum was and then the hemispheres would just fall apart uh, because there was then no, no external force anymore pushing them together. So um, yeah, quite famous experiment. You, 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 maybe have, you maybe have seen this picture here yeah, on some genes. This is the same, same kind of experiment, different force. Uh, so these Levi Strauss, he just copied the experiment from Otto von Gericke uh, to show how strong these pants or trousers or jeans are. And um, something more interesting maybe about this guy. So originally he was just written um, Gericke without, without the U. So like in German, Gericke. And then he married a French woman. And because, as far as I understood French, if you, um, if you would just have the E, then it would be called Jéric. And so he still wanted to be pronounced Gericke. And so they introduced this U so that it's still called uh, or still, pro still pronounced Gericke. Yeah, so some, some kind of German-French connection already in this name, uh, name pattern of our university. Okay, so before we further dive into the topic, some organizational matters, if you want to have a copy of the slides for sure, I will upload them later or I will send them to Laurent or to uh, Catherine and, and they can send them to you or upload them somewhere on the, I don't know, do you have a cloud storage of the university here or some e-learning system? How do you organize your teaching materials? Okay. But I would probably not have access to the site to upload it there, right? Because, okay. Uh, then I'm trying a recording at the moment. Um, so hopefully it works. We will see. And if you have questions in between, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I will also try to ask you some questions in between. And don't wait and hesitate, like, like you already did. Uh, uh, I will, I will, I will, it's, it's it, to be honest, it's a live stream on Twitch. Because it's the easiest way to do a recording because my, um, my laptop is not super powerful. So I'm, I'm currently, as you can see, I'm in a Zoom meeting and the Zoom meeting is, is, is doing some kind of live recording on Twitch. Okay, excellent. So then to start with the technical part, uh, I've tried to structure my presentation a little bit like this. So I will try to give you a brief introduction into this topic of DC motors. I mean, have you have you used? Uh, you are in your first year of studies. You you now study for something like half a year, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and I've I've learned I've heard that you had maybe something like eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours about electrical engineering. Okay, so you know at least a little bit what 
current is and voltage and resistance. Okay. And, and, and maybe have you heard of inductance, law of induction? Inductance, inductor, a coil. Okay, we will, we, will, we will find out. Okay, so first question is, I have a motor here uh, that I've shown a second ago, like, like, like this one here on my table. And I can switch it on once again. And then you see that it rotates. So question is, what does a motor do? What does an electric motor do? Exactly. So it converts. Excellent. So it converts uh, electrical energy or electrical power to mechanical power, to mechanical energy. And so electrical power converted into mechanical power. Uh, that, that. There are also different ways of power conversion possible that will not. That will not be covered in this lecture. So if you are interested in other asset, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not. If you are interested in something like this. Ask a chemist, ask process engineers, they know much better about combustion engines, for example, turbines, something like this. Okay, so next question is how to, how can, because at the end, if we want to model, uh, we need to have some formulas and stuff. So we need to have, we need to express this a little bit in technical terms and scientific terms. So next question is, how can we calculate electrical power or electric power? Do you know a formula to do this? Or what quantities do we need to calculate electric power? One thing, one, one thing that I've also learned, that there's an idea. Two times, yeah. And what is, what is, what does the U mean and what does the E mean? Say once again. So my camera stopped. So uh, you 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 already know the formula. So and what 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 did you say? What does the U mean? Yeah, intensity. I think it's not the correct word. Yeah, tension. Tension is t tension is better. Wait, this is this is nothing to. Okay. And and what what does what does the I mean? So I would say the U is voltage and what is I? The current, exactly. Okay, so we have voltage and we have current. Ah, like in this formula. And voltage is measured in volt, expressed in volt, current, you know, is expressed in ampere. Uh, volt 
Alessandro Volta was an Italian scientist. Ampere was a French scientist. Uh, and I, I think there are also um, 40 names of important scientists and engineers written on the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And I think Ampere is also one of them. Okay, so next question is how to calculate mechanical power? Yeah. So so I would write this equation like this. What does what does the omega mean? This is the angular speed exactly. Uh, you will you will get something different. So the don't don't eat this. Uh, these are uh, flower seeds. You can plant flowers. Okay, so um, omega. Is some speed. So what what does the M mean? What does the M stand for? Okay, once again. No, not not the. Uh, I don't I think it's the right thing. Any other ideas? What the M does stand for? Yeah, momentum, or in English we would say torque. So mechanical power is. Oops. Yeah, uh, is torque Oops. and torque is measured in Newton meters. Yeah, uh, so Newton uh, this year is the unit of the force, and meter is the unit of the distance of the radius. And then omega is said is this angular speed or rotational speed, something like this. Okay, so next question is, what else do you know about current and voltage? Yeah, so if we have a source like this one here, I can show my uh, my experiment is set up here once again and make it a little larger. Um, so I have a power, if I move the camera up a little bit, I have a power supply. It's currently set to five volts and had, it has a positive terminal and a negative terminal. And it's true that um, positive current will go from the positive terminal uh, which is usually denoted by the red wire, and then it will go through this red wire over this switch, over the red wire to my load here, to the motor, and then via this blue wire black to back to the black wire and, and back, back into the source here. So, yeah, current, positive current goes from the positive terminal of the source to the negative terminal of the source. And in reality, current... It's not positive current is made out of electrons and electrons are negative. Negative electrons come from the negative terminal and go to the positive terminal. But as an electric engineer, we don't really care about uh, Okay. Any other things that you know about current and voltage? Yeah, so we would say times. Yeah, so uh, multiplication is times. So U equals R times. I exactly. And so this is this is called this is called Ohm's law.
Ohm, Ohm was a Ohm was a German Georg Simon Ohm was a German scientist. Uh, you see that you really need an international community to uh, make some good research. And an Ohm's law means that um, if you feed some current through resistance, you will get a voltage. And the higher the resistance, the higher will be the voltage. Or at some resistance, current and voltage are proportional to each other. And the, the factor between them, the proportionality, is the resistance. And this is measured in ohms. OK. And this is yeah, so the, um, the voltage, the, 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 the force of the source is trying to push the current through some conductor, through some wire, yeah, and the resistance is like pulling back, uh, hindering the current. Okay. Um, so, something else that you know about current and voltage? And, and now we come to this. Um, so do you know what is inside? What is inside such a motor? Yeah, some rotor and some stator. Yeah, but I think not 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 really a DC motor. But I mean, this uh, rotor and stator is a good good idea. And so this is um, um, a DC motor with permanent magnets. So the stator will be just some magnets. And the rotor, how is the rotor built? From copper, and how is this copper formed? Is it just a big block of copper? No. Yeah, it's it's a winding, right? It's a coil. Um, it's like 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 this here. So you take a wire and you make a coil out of it. Um, and this is what we would call an inductor. First. So for these inductors, uh, there is Faraday's law of induction. Faraday was a British scientist, and Lenz was also a German scientist. So Faraday's law um, is written here, and the Lenz law gives the sign, the direction of this voltage and current. So you can see it's it's kind of a similar equation. Uh, so here we have the voltage. And on this side here, we also have the voltage. Um, and here's resistance and here's inductance. But what is what is this term here? Let me let me draw a circle around this. So what does this here mean? Exactly, it's the it's the time derivative of the current. So it means so so here, here on this side it means if we have a current, then we will get a voltage. Here it means we can have a current. Still, we might have no voltage, but if the current changes over time, if there's a time if there's a change of current, the current changes. Then some voltage is induced. This is what this law of Faraday's law of induction means. So every time we change a current, then we will get some voltage. So here means we have a current, we get a voltage. Here it means if the current changes, then we get a voltage. And so the change of current is proportional to the voltage, and the factor between them, this is called inductance. And inductance is measured in Henry. 
And Henry, I think, was also a British engineer or scientist. Um, and this funny meme here should say something else. So current uh, is proportional to the magnetic flux. Um, so if the um, yeah, so if, if the magnetic flux changes and the electric current would also like to change, no, 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 that, that then comes this this induced voltage because Lenz law says if there is a change in current, then there will be a voltage induced that is opposite to the original current. Yeah, so it's like pushing this current back. This is so this induced EMF. EMF is electromotive force. It's like a voltage. So this voltage is kind of hindering the current to change. So at some inductor, at, um, at the coil here, like this coil, uh, or at the coil inside the motor, um, this coil would always like that the current remains, that the current does not change. Like, I mean, do you know in electric, uh, in mechanical engineering for no, for sure, you know inertia. So if, if you move something and if there are no forces applied, then something will not stop moving. It will continue to move because it has inertia. And so a coil, like inside here or like this coil uh, will, will somehow give inertia for the current. So in, in, in a, the current flowing in such a coil would always like to continue to flow. That is what this picture here is trying to tell us. So let me remove this. Yeah, so if the current changes, some counter voltage will be induced. Okay, so enough for the introduction. Uh, we, are, we are nice on time. So the next idea or the next topic is how can we model such a motor? And so there's a good picture here of this motor. Uh, so you can see there's these two terminals, positive and negative. And then um, the, the stator and the rotor will be in here and something will rotate. And then there's a gearbox. So usually these direct current motors they rotate very fast, a couple of hundred or even thousands of revolutions per minute. And so this here rotates rather slow. So there's a gearbox in between. I won't open it up now, but otherwise you could see this gearbox. Question is, uh, what could be the purpose of this motor? Anyone some idea? Where, where could this motor be used? There's an idea over there. <laughs> exactly. So it's a, if you are in a car and you have these buttons on the door to, to lift up and to lower the window, and this is exactly such a motor, uh, you can also see the um, uh, greetings to the colleagues at Volkswagen, you know, German car manufacturer uh, located in Wolfsburg, not too far away from Magdeburg. And so this is an older uh, window motor. That's the purpose of this. And that's why it's also rotating that slow because you don't want to have the window going like, and you want to have it going slowly up and slowly down. And this is the purpose of this motor. Okay. So then the, the next question is how to, how to model such a motor. And so the thing is that as we discussed already so far, the motor has some electric behavior. So we have on the electrical side at these terminals, uh, so if I go back here, 
Um, remember what the motor does. The motor converts electrical power into mechanical power. So here on these terminals, we have electrical power. We have current and voltage. And on this terminal here, we have the mechanical power. We have torque and we have rotation. And so our model must somehow include this. So we must have some electrical part of the motor, some electrical model. And we must, must have something for the mechanical behavior of the motor. And of course, there must be some connection between them. So what happens is that the current creates a torque. So the current that we have on the electrical side, this creates a torque on the mechanical side. And then motor will start to turn. There will be some rotational speed. And the speed will create some back electromotive force into the electrical part. So there is a coupling between the electrical behavior and the magnetic behavior um, inside the motor. And this we, we would somehow need to incorporate into our, into our model. So then the question is, how to do it. And for the electrical part, um, you see that it's similar to what we have seen before. So we have a voltage coming from the source. So the source voltage, once again, would be uh, what, I, what I have here um, on my, my power supply. And then the motor has some internal resistance and we have Ohm's law for the internal resistance and the, the, the coil um, has some inductance and then we have this law of induction for the coil. And then we also have this back electromotive force uh, that comes from the rotational speed. Uh, so all these quantities we have inside the motor, they are all listed here once again. Uh, voltage, resistance of the winding, inductance of the coil, and current going through the motor. And now the question is, what happens with this part over here? Right? How, how can we calculate this? And this is set comes from the rotational speed. And this CP, I think this is something that was also mentioned before. Someone, someone said this, right? And asked for the mechanical power. So this the P is the, is the magnetic flux, and the C is from constant. So at the end, as electric engineers, we don't really care. We say, okay, there's, there's one constant that converts between speed on the mechanical side and this counter uh, electromotive force on the electrical side. So once again, not too complicated equation to do this because it's just some multiplication. Uh, so the if we go back to this one here, this is this is usually the hard part, right? To calculate this derivative. This is the challenging thing, but everything else is quite okay and quite simple to do. Okay, and in a similar way, we can calculate uh, the torque of the motor. So this will come from the current. If we know the current going through the motor on the electrical side, the same constant, we can calculate the torque, mechanical torque. And then we can set up some, some balance equation for the torque. Because the torque generated by the motor will go into friction. Um, and, and some losses, yeah? and then the motor has some inertia. And so the inertia, uh, same equation as before, has something to do with the derivative of the rotational speed. So the inertia 
makes that the motor would like to keep its rotational speed, that the rotational speed will not change. And there might be some external load. Um, in, in our example here, at the, at the mechanical output of this motor, there would be, of course, then the window connected, and the window has got weight when being lifted up, so this would be some mechanical load, something that you operate with the motor. Okay, but once again, not super complicated equation. Um, and now it would be interesting, but so inertia, you know, right? As mechanical engineers, more or less, okay. So then question is what, what, what to do or how to, what can happen with friction, how to model friction. So do you have any ideas? what different types of friction could occur in such a motor in such a system? And what would be the difference between them? And there's an idea. Yeah, something like with air. Mm -hmm. So let me let me write this down a little bit. So the idea that we have is we could have something with contact and we could have something with air. And contact friction is if you take both of your hands, put them together and do like this, and then you have contact friction and you will notice what will happen it will heat up. Uh, it gets warm very soon because you convert the mechanical energy into thermal energy due to this contact friction in your hands. And okay, if you if you run very fast, there will be also friction of the air. Uh, typically, it will not heat you up because uh, the air also dissipates the thermal energy and and. Uh, the, yeah, the energy losses due to friction around you. I think you have to move to a uh, very, very fast um, couple of hundred meters per second or some, um, yeah, something like this. Then, then you will also heat up in air because then you are creating friction losses faster and then the air could dissipate the energy. Um, okay, so what what would be the difference between this contact friction, or I would also call it sliding friction? Sliding. Uh, what would be the difference between this one and this one over there? Yeah, you always need to contact two two partners, but I would say with for the for the air friction, you also need to have you need to have the air and you need to have something that moves through through the air. So I would say for this because friction is something that you have force and the counter force, and you always need to have kind of two partners uh, to have friction, like in a like in a like in a marriage, like in a partnership, there might be also friction. So any other ideas about the difference between the two? This one and this one over here? And if we would, if I would draw a schematic and say, here on this axis, I would like to have the, the force of the friction. And on this axis here, I have omega. I have this rotation. What, what, what can happen or what will happen or what will be the difference between this one and this one over here?
So, um, sliding friction is yeah, a little bit difficult to show, but if I have my bottle here, which is almost empty. So, if I put the bottle on the table, there will be friction between the bottom of the bottle and the table. And so now if I if I rotate it, there will be there will be friction. There will be a frictional force. The question is, how does the frictional force change if I rotate the bottle more or less quick? So oops. so how will uh, how will the sliding force change? Or will it change? Any idea? Mm -hmm. So you you suggest it might look like this one yeah but i think it's just that if you if you move faster uh you 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 convert more energy because energy is something like force uh multiplied with um with distance and then you have more distance in shorter time so you have more energy you get more power but i think the, the force at the end stays the same but something like this can happen and um so there are three types of friction that can be distinguished and the first one as already mentioned, this contact friction, sliding friction, it is really more or less independent of the speed. So no matter how fast you rotate, it will always be the same kind of friction. And you can also a little bit uh, see this in my experiment here. If I would have just a very small force, I cannot, I cannot rotate this bottle. You always need to have a minimum force to, to rotate it, otherwise it won't move. Yeah, so for the sliding friction, it's almost, it's constant uh, with respect to the rotational speed. Then in the air or in water, you have something like this fluid friction. So that increases proportional to the square of the rotational speed and then there's also something where the friction is proportional to the speed, directly proportional. This is called viscous friction or viscosious friction. Um, this also happens in such a motor here, but it's more important if you have, for example, winding machines that would wind up paper, for example. Then you have something that uh, the friction, the force, is directionally proportional to the speed how fast you wind up paper for example okay so then of course in our motor model we could just combine the three into one joint friction and once again soma put this into formulas so this this goes friction is directly proportional to the rotational speed and this sliding friction there we need to have a sine function to make uh, to allow for this for this jump here in the diagram, because if you rotate it the other way around, of course, um, the 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 frictional force should be in the opposite direction. Yeah, so the the friction the friction will not turn around. Um, and for this air friction, fluid friction, it's the same thing. So you also need to have a have a sign here uh, to make this jump, and then something proportional to the square of the rotational speed. And then we need different constants, something in Newton meter, Newton meter uh, divided by radian per second or radian per second square. 
Okay, so then we can try to put this into some circuit schematic. And so for the electrical part, it's rather simple. We have the resistance. Have you seen the symbols before? You remember, okay, yeah. So this is resistance, this is inductance, this is the source, this is the power supply. In the car, it would be the battery. In my setup here, it's my, my, uh, my power supply. And does anyone have an idea what this symbol could be? So this year, uh, it's like it's like a voltage source, right? It's it, it it a little bit looks like this here on the other side, but it's not round; it's square. And these square sources are controlled sources. So this should be the voltage source for this back electromotive force that is generated by the speed. And um, so. This is a, a controlled source that is controlled by the mechanical part of the motor. So what we do, we take this, remember this equation for the back electromotive force. Yeah? We convert this into a pure electrical equation. And because we want to, we want to model this in some electric simulator and the electric simulator does not know about torque and speed and so on. Um, we use a current to model the speed and the current that is proportional to the speed in the mechanical part of the model will give us this back electromotive force here. And between there, there's a factor uh, like this CFE here and this factor has it's it's a little bit like ohm's law it's a little bit like um let me write it down on top of it it's a little bit like u is r times e or i and so this is the current this is the voltage so the factor in between must be some resistance and it's not really a resistance it's a it's a factor that converts between current and voltage so we call it trans resistance and it's measured in ohm. Okay, so now we have the electrical part of the motor. Now we need to have the mechanical part. And for the mechanical part, we need to transform our torque balance um, also into some electrical equation. Into so we can do it in some voltage law. So. Oops. So you can see that um, from this, from the torque, we convert the torque into a voltage. A voltage that is your, also one controlled source proportional to the torque. And uh, let me use different colors. So the, the angular speed here and the angular speed here, we convert as done before into a current and a current here. And so then we can see, okay, we need to have something for, for this, uh, if we assume viscous friction, different color. So for, for this viscous friction, we have a factor here that converts between speed and torque or between current and voltage. So this is once again like a resistance. So what is friction in the mechanical world? In the electrical world, it's, it's a resistance. And so the same, same thing happens over here. Uh, we have the inertia here and the same factor occurs here. So this is something that converts between this time derivative of a current and the voltage. So what is inertia in the mechanical side is inductance in the electrical side, as I've said. 
as 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 we've discussed before. So so the um, so at the end, the nice thing is we can model this whole mechanical equation in a quite similar um, electrical circuit. And so this resistance here is not the resistance of the motor. It's like the friction happening in the motor. And this inductance here is not the inductance of the armature coil. It's the, it's the mechanical inertia of the motor. And this is the torque generated by the motor. Uh, once again, some controlled source. And this is the load of the motor, the mechanical load, something that would be attached to the output um, of this motor. Okay, so let me delete this and go to the next slide. So here I've, I've just written all the constants. I will go over this because I've already explained. And so once again, we have this mechanical equation and we convert it into some electrical equation. And it's the same kind of trans resistance here, converting between the electrical current in the motor and the mechanical torque. So this is this conversion from the electrical side to the mechanical side. Okay, so that's our model. Um, and now question is, if, you, if we have such a motor and if we want to build a model for this motor that somehow works and replicates the behavior of the motor, of course, we need to find parameters of this model. So if we go back, um, so we have this, this friction here, we have this inertia, we need to have this K factor. And if we go to the electrical side, uh, where was the electrical model? Uh, here was my electrical model. So we need to have uh, the resistance of the motor and the inductance of the motor. These are the parameters that we need to find for, for my certain motor here uh, to make this model work. So question is, how, how can we determine these parameters? What measurements could we do or what features of the motor could we measure? Um, and before answering this question, or before you, you can try to answer this question, I will show you what measurement results we have available. So um, maybe I can uh, enable tracking of my camera and move over here. So I've, in a, in a large suitcase in the train, I brought some measurement equipment from Magdeburg. So you probably have seen something like this before and used it in some, have you done some electrical engineering measurements? Yeah, so this is a plain classical multimeter uh, from Fluke. It can measure voltage, it can measure current, it can measure resistance and so on. It has like the two leads, positive and negative. Okay, so I have one of these multimeters. Then as already shown, I have a power supply. A power supply is like a source. And the good thing about this power supply, you can also see it here on the slides, is that I can change voltage, I can change current, and it will also directly measure and display current and voltage. And there's a button to switch it on and off, and there are two connectors, um, very nice power supply. So what else do I have? Um, we, we might also want to measure currents as a function of time. And for this, I have brought a current probe. So this is how this current probe looks like. Um, so or current clamp, um, you, can, you can put it around the conductor. Uh, so the conductor goes to this, you close the clamp and do you have an idea how it works, how it can measure the current without really being connected to the wire? Because I just put to measure to measure a current. If I, if I would try to demonstrate it on this example here. Uh, so what you do is you put the current clamp around the wire. So how can the 
current probe measure current through the wire? Any idea? How, how can it measure current without because if I if I want to measure current with this with this multimeter here, I have to open up the circuit, plug this in between, then the current will really flow through these wires, through the instrument, will be measured and will go back to the circuit. But here with this one, I can measure current without having to open the circuit. But how does it work? La magique. So it, it, it works, it happens via the magnetic field. If you have a current flowing somewhere, there will be a magnetic field around the current. And this magnetic field will go in, into this probe and the probe will measure the magnetic field. And then will display a chorus or it will, at the output, you will get a corresponding uh, voltage can be seen on the slide. I can maybe enlarge it a little bit. So, uh, can I? Yeah, uh, I can. I can try at least. So, there's here some close up, and then you can see it. Uh, it can measure up to 100 amperes, which is quite a lot, and it shows something like 100 or 10 millivolts per ampere, uh, and one volt maximum of voltage. So this is how this current clamp works. Okay, and what else do I have? I have a voltage probe. It's, it's inside this box here. Ah, and, and what I forgot to say, of course, this is uh, from a nice French company. Uh, as if I, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but I've learned it's called Chauvin en nous. Is this right? More or less, how would you say? Chauvin en nous. Okay. And uh, another, so this, the, the high voltage probe is from another nice French company, um, which is called Le Croix, right? More or less. How would you say? Le Croix? Okay, Le Croix. I am, okay. I've, I've asked several people in Germany and about half of them said Le Croix and the other half said Le Croix. So I was, okay. Um, and so this, this voltage probe looks like, looks like this. Um, you get it in this nice box and this is the thing that I have over here. And it can measure up to 6,000 volts. The question is, why do I need to have such a high voltage probe to do measurements on my motor here? And the motor is just operated with 5 volts, 10 volts, 12 volts. Why do I need to have um, a probe that can handle much more voltage. Any idea for this? Yeah, and, and why is the voltage intensity too high? Because my, my, if, I, if I go back to the power supply here, the power supply has just five volts. Um, and to be honest, I don't expect 6,000, but I expect maybe 100 or maybe 200. And this would be too much for my instrument. Um, and that's why I need to have this high voltage probe. But where do 100 volts or 200 volts come from? If I only have this five volts at my uh, at my my power supply, so but I mean, 
still mm -hmm. good so uh, i can i can go back to this schematic here so i have i have 12 volts here or 5 volts something like this and then i operate this motor and the motor has some inductance and remember the equation for the inductance if the current changes i will i will go back to this uh, equation here for the inductance if the current changes some voltage will be induced this was this law of induction so if i if i operate the motor and if i switch off the motor i i with with the switch here yeah, so if I do like this here in the experiment, so here's the switch. I can switch on the motor and I can switch it off. And if I switch the motor off, I force a very rapid change of the current. There will be a very rapid change time derivative of the current. And that's why there will be a high voltage induced just for a very short limited amount of time, but there, there can be a very high voltage spike when switching off this motor. And that's why I need to have this, um, this uh, 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 high voltage probe. Okay. So, most of, the, uh, most of the equipment already done. So last thing that I need, and I brought this, in another box, which is over here. Um, it's already here also on my table and I can show it in a real picture. Yeah, so this is an oscilloscope. Uh, it's called Picoscope. I think it's also a French company, I'm not sure. Um, have, you, have you done measurements with oscilloscopes before? No, but you you know that something like an what what does it what does it do? What is the purpose of an oscilloscope? What is what is the difference between an oscilloscope and a multimeter? Yeah. So with an oscilloscope you can measure the waveform. Here you can measure a value, a different value or a different value from our value. Um, but if the value in, if the value changes slowly, you can look at the slow changes here. But if the value changes rapidly, then you cannot see the changes on on the display here. So you need to have an oscilloscope uh, to measure these rapid changes. I'm sorry. Okay, so. Uh, now we can come to the question. So what, what, what measurements could we do with this? And there should be a text field and you can type something into this text field. You could also ask GPT, but I don't expect it to be super helpful in this part. But you could write something in, in, in French. Uh, please put it into Google Translate or Deeple or something like this before sending it, because I don't understand any French. And in the meantime, while you uh, while you fill in the survey, and there are also also a couple of responses. Uh, so I can I can tell what I've also learned. Uh, is that um, if you pronounce. ChatGPT in in French. 
and it means Okay, but there are already a couple of good ideas. Uh, so there's an Australian rock band mentioned ACDC. Yeah, for sure we could do something with AC and DC, but it's a it's a it's a DC motor, so it won't do anything good with AC. We can for sure have a look at the current in time. We can look at the power used by the motor. Uh, we can try to measure voltage. Frequency rotation, yeah, something like this happens. And the, 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 okay, okay, the voltage. And this looks like a ChatGPT answer here. DC motors can be measured, characterized in various ways to assess their performance in operating conditions. Was this conversation helpful so far? Please rate ChatGPT. Okay. So thanks for the great ideas. Uh, let's see what we can do. So we can we can try to measure voltage and current and uh, try to measure current in time. So I have noted down my ideas. And so what we can do for sure is we can... I will, I will disconnect the motor here from my power supply. And take the multimeter, put it somewhere here. And then I have the problem, as you can see, that the, this multimeter has some, some measurement tips. Um, and it's it's challenging to connect them to there. So I have luckily uh, you always need lots of these adapters. So I have I have some clamps that I can connect here. So I've set it to measure resistance, and I can try to measure the resistance between these clamps. And then you see that uh, already my cables have some resistance, 0 0.2 ohms. Uh, just the clamps and the cables and so on. Okay, so then I can use this and connect it to the motor. It does not really matter if I connect black to blue and, and, and red to red, but I will do so. And so then you can see that we measure um, a resistance of the motor, pure DC resistance of something like around one ohm. And we would need to subtract or um, compensate the 0 0.2 ohm just from the cables. So, but the, the motor resistance is something around one ohm. Uh, and Okay, so this is measured with the multimeter. Um, so now I will remove this multimeter once again, turn it off, and connect the motor back to my DC power supply here. And at first, I will... I will set, um, I will use a voltage which is so small that the motor won't probably won't rotate at just one volt. And it's not yet switched on, so that's why we don't have any current. But if I switch it on, you see nothing changes. Um, but there is a current. So, for one volt, 
we have 0 0.9 amperes of current flowing. And now at the moment, also just the resistance of this motor will be active. And because it's not, current is not changing, so the inductance does not do anything, the, current, the, the motor is not rotating, so we don't have this big electromotive force. So question is, from these two values, so if I if I note down from values over here, so the resistance measured with the multimeter was around, let's say around one hundred. It's not perfectly accurate. And so the resistance measured. With my power supply, how can I, from these values, calculate the resistance? Yeah, so U is R multiplied with I if I convert this formula into the direction of the resistance. Yeah, so it will be U divided by I, right? So it will be one volt divided by 0 0.9 ampere. Um, so who has a calculator who can calculate it? What is 1.1 exactly. So approximately 1.1 ohm. Okay. So we have DC resistance measured with the multimeter. We have uh, DC resistance measured with the power supply. Um, what we could maybe also do is take a curve how current changes via voltage or versus voltage. So I will try to draw a schematic here. Uh, maybe use the darker color. And maybe use something like this. Let me say this is our voltage axis and this will be the current axis. And so at the moment we have one volt, this is U in volt, and we have, yeah, around, this is the current in ampere. At the moment, we have something like this here. Uh, so at one, approximately one. Okay, so then I can go up. So up to two volts. Um, then the current approximately doubles, so I also get something like two ampere, quite quite exactly. Let me show you this also in the in the schematic over here. Okay. So I will further increase the voltage. And now you can see at three volts, the motor starts to rotate. And interestingly, now I increased the voltage, but the current went down once again. Uh, from, uh, from two amperes, now we have just something like one, one and a half. So it's, At 
three volts is just one and a half ampere. And now I will go up in maybe a little higher steps. So this is four, this is five. So for five volts, we have 1.8. Um, I will go maybe to seven. So here's six, here's seven. You can see that the motor now rotates much more uh, rapidly. And at seven volts, we get slightly over two ampere. And let's go to maybe to nine. So here's eight, nine. And for nine, we also get slightly over two. Um, and now this is really the operational speed of this motor. So at 12 volts, we have slightly above two ampere. So the curve looks a little bit strange. Maybe I will go down to two and a half or so to fill this gap between where, it, so at three it's rotating, at two it stops. Uh, now I have to push this button to change the digits here. So if I go to, to two and a half, um, yeah, then it's also something like this. And so, so the curve looks like this, that current increases. Then the motor starts to rotate and the current goes down to a certain value and then it slightly goes up once again. So this is how, how the current voltage curve of this motor looks like. Move the picture here to the top. Okay. So luckily I've saved this and I will need all the results. And so we can continue with, um, now looking at what you what you also suggested here in my survey, look at how the current changes in time. And so for this, um, I I need my oscilloscope. So I will make the picture once again a little larger. And now take this current probe and connect the current probe to the oscilloscope on channel A. And then you can see here, it's, it's a bit difficult to see, but this, this current probe due to the magnetic field or direction of the magnetic field, it also measures a certain direction of the current. Uh, so it, the current is pointing towards me. Uh, so I will measure, because it's the easiest way to connect here, I will measure the current on the on this negative terminal and close the probe. And then this is an active probe. So I need to switch on this probe. And I will uh, switch it in this direction that we can measure here with 10 millivolts per ampere. Okay, so this is connected. And uh, I will switch off the, or no, I will maybe go to this different setting and lower the voltage a little bit so that I don't need to block the motor. I will just use a voltage where the motor will certainly not operate, these two volts. Okay, so now I need to have a program for my scope. It's called Tico. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's loading, and this is now definitely some advantage of using some such an USB scope is that you can directly show values on the screen. Yeah. So you otherwise I would have a small instrument here, and I would uh, need to um, print or, or have a camera to capture the the um, screen of the instrument. So now it here works directly, and. Uh, let me move my, my zoom bar here a little bit up a bit. So now you see that it's already measuring something. I have to tell uh, the program that we use a current probe here. So at the moment, it's measuring, as you can see, it's measuring voltage in millivolts. So I will change it, and I will say it's my, um, my current probe here set to this 100 millivolts per ampere. And then, interestingly, the program will automatically change to milliampere, measuring current. So now I will, that's my camera win once again. So now I will switch on, switch on the motor here with my switch. And then you can see that something changes. Uh, something changes in the background. And then you can see that at the moment we are measuring slightly below two amperes of current, which perfectly makes sense because my instrument here, my DC power power supply, also shows something like 1.9 amperes of current. And if I switch off, then current is gone and we go back into noise. So now I want to capture exactly the moment when I switch on. So to, to make a measurement exactly in this moment when I switch on the current. Um, and yeah, has any one of you a slight experience in, in uh, doing this oscilloscope measurements? No, never before. Okay, so the, the thing that we need now is called a trigger. And you can set it here. So we want to have we want to have a single measurement and we want to have a single measurement if we have a rising edge, for example, going through one ampere. So I can, I can increase the level here and you can see how this yellow dot here goes up. Um, and I know that I expect a current in the range up to two amperes, so I will use this range and go up to two ampere and also move this here a little bit. And now let's say start some measurement. Yeah, and now it's now it's measuring, now it's waiting for the event. I will show the camera window. And now I will switch on the switch on the motor. Oh, and this was not a nice switching event, or maybe it was, but you can see that something very rapid changes are here, but it's not really, we, we don't see really how the motor switched on. So our, the time window that we are looking at is way too short. And the time window is displayed here. It's just 20 microseconds. So it's super, super small. So I will enlarge it a little bit. Let's maybe go into the milliseconds range, something like this. So. I will switch off the motor once again. And restart the measurement. And switch it on once again. Ah, and now we can see a nice curve. So this is exactly what you would expect when switching on um, such an resistance and resistive and inductive load, a resistance and some inductor in series. Do you know what type of function this is? Exponential function, exactly. It's, it's also difficult to throw them, it's more difficult to catch. 
Yeah, so it's some exponential function. And from this exponential function, we can, we can get the time constant. So in Zoom, what I will do is I will try to find something here to uh, draw a line. So we can see that the, the maximum value that we have is somewhere here on top, like the, 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 the almost two ampere that we have. This is the, the asymptotic value that this exponential function is trying to approach. And so if we, if we use a tangent line from any point and draw it until it hits this asymptotic line, then this distance here between these two lines, this will be some time constant. And if we continue to do this, so once again, if I go down here to this place and have some, uh, some tangent, yeah, it does not really fit that nice, but so this would be another time constant. If I do it here and repeat this procedure, this would be another time constant and so on and so on. So the time constant, I think there's some issue here with this. Maybe, maybe let's repeat it uh, once again. because the schematic here does not look that nice. So switch off and switch on once again. And then it maybe looks a little nicer. Still there is some that the switch flips a little bit. Okay, this I think this looks quite good. This is a nice switch on event. So I will try to delete all stuff and draw it once again. So here's this asymptotic curve. And it, it, it will be quite the same if you switch on um, some motor for the, for the mechanical thing, yeah, for the, for the speed. That at the beginning, the, the motor revs up very quickly, and then the speed will approach some limit. So the same thing happens on the mechanical side, but here we are looking at the current, at the electrical values. So once again, some tangent to this gives uh, the time constant, and if we repeat this, this will give another time constant, and if we repeat this, this will give another time constant, and so on. And so this time, this time we call tau. And this tau, you're from the values in the diagram, how large is it approximately? If you if you check the um, the range here, how long is this time approximately? Yeah, one point two, and the unit. The unit is uh, is very small, written somewhere here or, or written here on the top. So it's millisecond. And so this time constant also corresponds to the ratio between the inductance and the resistance. And we already know the resistance because we have measured it before. So with this uh, kind of approach, we can calculate the inductance of the motor from this time constant. So it will be this time constant times the resistance. And remember the resistance was something like around one ohm. So we get around 1.2 milli Henry. This will be the inductance of the motor. Okay. So let me take a picture of this. And so now we have inductance and resistance on the
On the electrical side, and so now we can repeat the same stuff with the with the real motor really running. Um, so let me find my scope program here once again. And so now what I will change, I will use a much higher voltage. I will go up to 12 volts. And I will change the setting here on the current probe. And change the setting here. Okay, and I will make the range a little larger that is displayed here. And then we can trigger once again and switch on the motor. And this works perfectly nice. And so this is how the typical current looks like if you switch on a motor that for a short time, 10 milliseconds or for a larger motor, maybe also something like 20, 50, 100 milliseconds, there will be much higher current. This is also if the, if you start the engine in your car or if you have some electric scooter or something like this. So every time you start the engine for a short time, there will be a really, really high current. Yeah, you can see it's up to uh, up to 12 amperes. And then, then the motor starts to rotate. Then there will be this back electromotive force. Uh, remember this law of induction and Lenz law, it will, it will be opposite to the original current. And so then the current will go down. And then you can see that the current still somehow fluctuates and changes. And this is, a little bit what you have also uh, written here in the slides. Um, yeah, this is like the, the, the frequency rotation or frequency of the motor um, that we can see in this measurement. Okay, so I will also take a picture of this setup and there's a question. Say, can you can you please be a little more quiet so I can understand the question? Merci. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, why are these bumps exactly? So this is this is what I, what I was trying to explain. Um, so it's a DC motor. And so we have a DC current and voltage on the outside. And we have this rotor. And there, um, there's something that is called the collector to feed the current from the outside, from the starter to the rotor. And so there's something that moves and there are the connecting parts. And so the current needs to change from one part of the collector to the next part, to the next part, to the next part. So the resistance changes, and that's why the current changes. And this, this, this change here, this is proportional to the speed of the motor. So from these changes, we could somehow measure the, the speed, the velocity of the motor. I can try to uh, repeat it. Um, so if I go down to to six volts, for example. And if we repeat the measurement, so now it's running. And if I switch it off once again, ah, so now you can see that it also rotates, not that slow, uh, not that fast anymore, much slower. And if I, that these, the changes here are not that pronounced and that they are also slower in time. And it's because, yeah, uh, so good question. Um, I should maybe add a picture for this. DC motor collector. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's, you can see it's because, because of this part here or, or this part. So when the current commutates from one coil to the next coil to the next coil, it will, it will change. Yeah, so it's called commu commutator. Have you seen this before? Okay. Yeah, so this is the typical way how these motors look on the inside. Okay. Um, so let maybe maybe take a short screenshot of this and go back to my slides. So last thing that we could measure is a voltage transient of the running motor. So now I will use uh, the voltage probe and also connect the voltage probe. And uh, this voltage probe works in a way that uh, I at first need to connect it here. Um, and so this is the probe. Usually uh, you measure voltage at a certain position, at a certain terminal. Um, but to measure voltage, like with some multimeter, you need to have two terminals. And the second terminal here, you have to, the ground, you have to connect extra. This is this, this um, shorter wire here. So I will connect this short wire and I will connect the, the black side to this blue wire. And I will connect the red side to the red wire. Let's see if this works. Okay, this looks quite good. And so now this is connected to channel B of my oscilloscope. So, now I can use channel B and I will say this channel B is here my high voltage probe with a factor of 1000 and switch it on and use it in this automatic mode and maybe just let it run. So at the moment motor is not switched on um, nothing is happening. I'm just measuring noise. Let me make the camera window here a little smaller so that it also fits on the screen. So now if I if I go and switch on the motor, yeah, so now we have current and voltage. I can make the, the range a little smaller. So there's the current. You can also see how the current changes due to this commutator. And then we have some voltage here. And the voltage, um, I think it's already the smallest range here. Yeah, so the, the voltage is, is around six volts. It's, um, it's the voltage that I've also set here on the display. So if I make the time a little larger, and now, Yeah, so now you can see if I change uh, the voltage, voltage will get higher, current will get higher. And now the interesting thing happens if I switch off the motor, something like this. Yeah, so switch on, switch off, switch on, uh, switch off. And the switch on we had already seen. And now I would like to look at this how it switches off. Uh, so once again, I, I set it to this um, single measurement mode. And now when switching off, I don't have a rising edge, I have a falling edge. Current goes down. So I switch it to falling edge. Um, and Okay, and um, 
of course, I need to have to I need to have the motor running first. And now, if I switch it off, nothing happens. I, because I think my current here is too high, so I just need something like one ampere. So switch on and switch off. Then nothing happens. Interesting. Ah. Okay, and there we get a single picture, and now the time is just a little too long, so I will uh, make the time a little smaller, maybe something like this, and trigger the measurement once again, so this looks quite good, so switch on, and switch off, exactly, and then we get a nice curve how this motor switches off. And so here you can see how the, from, from, from this measurement, we could get the inertia of the motor. We could get the mechanical parameters of the motor because in this, how long it takes for the motor to switch off, there's inside there how much inertia the motor has and how much friction the motor has. So from this remaining measurement, we could get the missing parameters in our motor model. Yeah. That, that's the idea. That's, uh, that's the measurement here. Okay, and maybe I will just take the picture and um, repeat it once again uh, with higher voltage. No, we already had 12 volts. Okay, so this is, this is nice. Okay, so then let me shortly go back to my slides. Um, yeah, so... To, to summarize a little bit what, what oh, and there, there's a question. And you need to be quiet, please, once again, because otherwise I can't understand the question. Uh -huh. You mean like um, for, the, for the current here? Yeah. Because... Uh, because due to the switch, I can, I mean, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, and it would certainly not work this way, or I'm not sure if it would happen the same way as uh, if I would just turn off this instrument. So there's really a, a small switch here. And if I switch off the switch, there are two contacts in there and the contacts go, go open. So there can't be any current anymore. And that's why the current rapidly goes down. And if we, if we would zoom in there, uh, so it's a good thing. Uh, it's maybe, maybe we can dive a little deeper into this. Uh, so I will, I will decrease the time range. And let's repeat the measurement. So it's triggered and I will switch the motor on. And here you can see, okay, all, already during switching on, something happens, uh, but I will, I will trigger the measurement once again and switch off. And now the interesting thing happens as I've mentioned, if we switch off the current with the switch, the current needs to rapidly change over time. And if we, if we go back to this equation here, if, if the current is hot, switched off, and the current rapidly changes over time, then a huge voltage will be will be induced, and this is this is what we see here. So for a short moment, uh, you can see that we have something like minus twenty volts. So from the twelve volt of the power supply, we generate a much higher voltage due to the switching, and this is how these um, 
I will come to your question in a second. This is how these how these um, if you high voltage generators, these electroshockers, if you want to shock something with a high voltage, this is exactly the way how they work. Or if you have a if you have some electrical pens for the kettle for the cows on the field, exactly exactly the way same way. You switch on some inductor, it will be charged. And then you switch off the current, but the inductor wants to force the current, it induces a high voltage. And then for a short moment, you get a very high voltage spike. That's the idea. Yeah, and if we if we zoom in further, zo zoom in more, um, trigger the experiment once again. Yeah, so switch on. Okay, it will trigger something. This was the switching on process. Now I will once again switch it off. Yeah, and now you can see the, the more I zoom in, uh, the more interesting this behavior gets. Because now I get much more than, uh, yeah, it says here, uh, my, my channel was overshooting. Because the more you zoom in, the higher this voltage gets. Because if it's, it's it's super short, so if you sample it too slow, you don't see the, the minimum voltage. And this is the reason why I'm using this high voltage probe. Okay, and then there's a final question over there. Yeah, you mean like... Um, uh, you mean the, the difference in this curve here that was visible here? Yeah. Let me zoom out once again to this and repeat, maybe repeat the measurements. This is also a very good question. So they're switching on, they're switching off. So you mean why um why the voltage goes down a little bit? directly jumps down and then goes constantly down. This is, is this a question? Why, why do we have this jump here in this place? No. Please, please. Guys, please be, be quiet for a second. We are finished in, uh, in three minutes. And then, and then uh, last question, please be quiet. Uh -huh. I don't I don't think so at the moment because we then we would be it would be necessary to directly measure at the rotor, for example, to see this difference, to measure at different positions. But I can only measure at the terminals here. Yeah, and that's why we don't really see it at the moment. Okay, so uh, to wrap up. So from all these measurements, and once again, looking at these um, circuit schematics uh, from, from the measurements that I've just shown, uh, you can take a look at this in the slides if you need it later on. You can get all the parameters of the motor that you need. Um, yeah, so let me go back to the beginning. So we, we look at the, at the block motor. From the block motor, we get the resistance. Because just resistance is active. Um, so then we look at the at the running motor. From the running motor, there is torque, there is speed, there is friction already. So we get the coupling factor between the electrical and mechanical part. We get the friction. So then we look at the block motor in dynamic observation. From this, this was this exponential function. From this, we get the inductance. And then we look at um switching off the running motor and from this we get the inertia of the motor and so from there we have all the parameters and we have a very nice model and so now what we will continue with is to do some simulation and lt spice and this is what we will do in smaller groups in this computer room in i don't know which building but you, you know you know it probably better than me yeah, so um, we are finished here for today. Thanks for attending. Thanks for all the nice questions. Um, yeah, there's there's some more.
some more here and some more there. Oh. And then uh, see each and every one today in the group and tomorrow in the three groups in the computer room. Bye-bye. Okay, and with this, I will click, stop sharing the screen and uh, say bye-bye and click on stop screaming. Live stream on.